chapter 22 of Genesis is a it is an absolutely fascinating chapter. There's a lot of things we're going to make reference to, so I had to actually write down references, Bible references. Um, chapter 22 comes out of nowhere, if you stop to think about it, because this is the offering of Isaac and Abraham telling or being told by God to offer Isaac. At first glance, it, it's bizarre on its face, but the more that you examine it, the stranger it becomes. Now, because we have the New Testament, we understand so much more about this. But at the time, what a bizarre thing to ask. What you have in chapter 22 is Abraham being asked to offer Isaac. Okay, now Isaac is the son of the promise, right? So he's the son that God had promised that they would have, and that because of Isaac, that the generations or the nations would be blessed. So from the time that he was given this promise until the time that Isaac actually showed up was 25 years, right? So they had to wait around. Now, we know that because of impatience and taking matters into their own hands and not finding out enough detail, they made the folly or they ran into the folly of Ishmael because of Hagar and all that stuff, right? Where if, when they had put together their plan, Abraham had gone to God and said, hey, my wife's come up with this idea. Uh, what do you think? God would have said, not what I want you to do. Wait another 12 years, and you'll have the son of the promise, and you would have avoided all the nightmare that there is because of Ishmael and, and Hagar and all that stuff. So for a guy who seemed to take matters into his own hands a lot of times, of course, he had very great successes in trusting God. We know that from the very beginning because God said, get up out of the land where you are, and I'm going to take you to a place that you don't know. And he was willing to go. And so he sees God as trustworthy. But we just had the deal with Abimelech. And uh, back in chapter 12, we had the, or uh, not 12, but uh, in, uh, what was it, 16, we had the deal that, that came up where he made up the whole thing with Pharaoh and tried to tell Pharaoh that Sarah is his sister. So they had that whole thing planned out. We know that that had been from the beginning when they left originally out of Haran. It was any time that somebody asks, tell them you're my sister. And then that way we'll avoid all the problems. Well, so there were those times that he didn't walk by faith. In this time, chapter 22, he is going to do far and away, hands down, the single greatest of his, his things where he trusts God. Because now finally with all of the mess and all the folly of Ishmael and all that stuff, now he's being asked, after waiting for this son, who's no longer a child, he's being asked to offer him up. So, pretty amazing thing. He doesn't even question it. Now, I'm, I'm sure that when it was first said to him, there had to be at least some question, some doubt in his mind. It's not recorded for us. Chapter 22 gives us the details. And there are some details that are excluded here that make you wonder. How much did he consider this before following through with it? Why was it that Isaac didn't fight back? And he was no, he was no young man anymore. Remember, he was 100 by the time Isaac shows up. And somehow uh, Abraham is able to tie him up. And again, he's not a kid. It would assume, we would assume because Sarah dies in chapter 23, it would seem that that follows pretty quickly thereafter. She's 127 when she dies, but she was 90 when she had Isaac. So he may have very well been in his 30s by this time, and yet Abraham was able to tie him up. So interesting stuff. A lot of very interesting unanswered questions here. He's also told to make, Ab or to make Isaac a burnt offering. A burnt offering. Now, we don't even know what a burnt offering is as far as God is concerned until Exodus chapter 20, right after the Ten Commandments were given. And so they, they made an altar and they offered a burnt offering there. And then again in chapter 29 of Exodus, you'll get that too, where it talks about a little bit more, that they would skin the animal and that the animal's skin would be something given to the priests. You get that in Leviticus chapter 7. Leviticus chapter 1 gives you more of the details about how it would be done, what parts would be burnt up entirely. And this idea of a burnt offering is the word olah in the Hebrew, and it means to ascend up. Now, it can actually mean staircases that ascend up, as you would see in, in uh, uh, 1 Kings 10. When the Queen of Sheba comes to see Solomon, 
and she's just amazed at his ability to answer questions and all the rest of that. And she was amazed at the palace by which he would ascend up to, you know, to the, the place of the temple and all the rest of that. That's the word Ola, the ascent or the going up. So remember that when you see burnt offering, it means the going up or the rising up. In this case, it would be the aroma of the sacrifice. So here, Abraham, before there was a formal reason why a burnt offering would be offered, it's the second time that it's mentioned. The only time a burnt offering is mentioned before this is back in chapter 8, verse 20, where it's Noah who offers up uh, a burnt offering as he you know, exits from the ark and all that kind of stuff. So really interesting. What's being asked here at first, you know, just first read through it, it's not until you start asking all of these questions. Why a burnt offering and who told him what a burnt offering is? And when did God ever say sacrifice a human being? That would be a detestable thing as far as God is concerned. He, he, he judged Israel for offering their children as a sacrifice to Molech. So here he's asking Isaac to take the son of the promise and offer him up. Well... As you start to ask those kind of questions, it becomes obvious there's more going on here than meets the eye. And if you wanted to find, I believe, the key for all of this, what we are looking at is an incredible type of Jesus and all the rest of it, as we will look at a little bit further. And I'll refer you to one verse found in John chapter 5, verse 39, where Jesus is talking with the Pharisees in the argument, and he says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, but they testify of me. So if you want to know what chapter 22, in my estimation, is here for, it is not for historical reference. It is not for anything else. It is because we are seeing a type of Jesus Christ and we are seeing a type of the Father and the offering of a Son and all of that, which we will jump into as we go through the text. But all that is just background for you to go, yeah, man, there's more here than meets the eye. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. As we come to your word, we, we are, of course, we're studying through it in the historical sense as we go through the book of, Exodus, or, uh, of Genesis, rather, and we're seeing the early parts of you putting together the nation through Abraham and, and, of course, with Isaac. But there is such an important teachable moment as you are teaching uh, elements of the gospel 2,000 years before the event. And so we would ask, Lord, that you would help us to see the big picture here and why this is put here for our remembrance, knowing all the well, or all the time, uh, full well, that you had a much larger thing in mind when it came to Abraham and that through him the nations would be blessed. God, open our eyes to the truth of your word and, and instruct us, we ask, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen? So chapter 22 starts out really just kind of like so matter of fact, which of course is always entertaining to me because we're reading about something that you, you've just got to be kidding me. This is what God expects him to do, right? So we see in chapter 22, it begins this way. It says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on the one mountain of which I will tell you. Now, there's so much just in these first couple of verses that are important. We see in verse 1 where it says, now it came to pass that God tested Abraham. And people will hear that and say, well, wait a minute. It sounds as though like God is doing something that we hear that he doesn't do. He doesn't tempt people. James tells us that, right? God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt well, it's, this is a testing, and people would say, well, it means the same thing. What it means in James is that God would never do something that is intended to trip someone up to the point where they will stumble. It's not God who causes them to sin. He doesn't give them the impossible. Now, we also have to remember in this that God knows exactly what Abraham is going to do. So this isn't to prove to God that he's going to do this. This is that Abraham is going to prove not only his own willingness to do this, but this would be for the generations. This would be for Abraham's benefit that he would do these things and be willing to do this. Again, God's aware of this. He knows exactly how this is going to play out. But he, he wants to find out, or I should say he's going to demonstrate, that Abraham has really kind of turned a corner here in that idea of faithfulness. He's willing to do something that is so unthinkable that he waited for 25 years for the son to be born, knowing that he's the son of the promise. Remember, that promise began the first time that you see it is in chapter 12. 
And it's in the first few verses where God says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and because of you, the nations are going to be blessed. Again, the generations of mankind, because Messiah is going to come through him. Now, I mentioned something this morning, and I think it's important for us to remember. When we look at Old Testament history and we think Abraham and we think Jesus and the time up to there, we don't think of it in terms like really long distances of time, but it is. Let's remember that from the time that this is taking place until Jesus is about the same amount of time as it is from where Jesus gave his life to our time. It's about 2,000 years. Okay? So from Abraham's obedience until we saw it acted out in its perfection in the person of Jesus is about 2,000 years. So we're looking at 4,000 years back in its recorded history. There's one place that we visit in, uh, in Israel when we're up in Dan, and you're seeing there a gate from the Canaanite time. It's about 4,000 years old. It's when you realize, yeah, there really is a history that goes back that far. And so, as we read here, it says, it came to pass that God tested Abraham, said to him, Abraham, and of course he says, here I am, that, you know, wonderful thing, what is it that you would have? Well, in verse 2, he said, take now your son, your only son. This isn't even recognizing Ishmael. And yet, we, we studied last week that when it got really ugly again between Hagar and, and, uh, and Sarah and Ishmael and all that stuff, that for the second time they were cast out and they wouldn't return this time. And even at that, when, when Hagar thought that Ishmael was going to die because they had run out of water, God makes a provision and he says, I'm going to make a nation out of him. So it's not a, a lack of recognition of Ishmael, it's just that he has nothing whatsoever to do with the promise. There's only one that God would ever recognize, and that's Isaac. <laughs> now, take the son that you love, your only son, and offer him to me as a burnt offering. God would never ask for a human sacrifice, and a burnt offering is one that is offered for sin. So there's so much more that's going on here, and it wouldn't make sense until Jesus comes along and says, look, the scriptures testify of me, as I had mentioned that John passage. So for us, as we go forward looking in this text, let's remember that that is the focus of this. And then we'll look at the parallels as we kind of end in this tonight. Well, so he says, take your son whom you love and go into the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain of which I will tell you. Now, Moriah is mentioned one place else that is, uh, gives an identification of, of what it would be. And it is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 3 at verse 1. And it is the place where Solomon built the temple. Now we know where that would be because it is Jerusalem. We know that that's the place where that had taken place because it had been traditionally built, burnt down, rebuilt. That history is well established. But Moriah that we hear mentioned here, you would have to say, well, where would it be? I think Chronicles helps us to understand it. Now, scholars disagree on this. Because they start looking at it from an intellectual and a scholarly point of view. I stop and say, well, wait a minute. If Moriah is the place where Abraham offered Isaac, it would, it would certainly be the place where God had offered Jesus. And we know where that is. We know that that was Jerusalem. So we know where that place was. So of the available information that we have, it would only make sense if he was at Beersheba and he was having a three-day travel, it would go to that place. Now, it's, it's averaging about 15 miles a day. It's no little small little walk. But from Beersheba up to Jerusalem, it makes sense that that same Moriah, where this would have taken place, because it is all symbolic of what was going to be done in Jesus, it only makes sense that we're talking about the same place. And it would be known as Moriah because that's where Solomon built the temple. It all makes sense. It fits together very, very nicely. So we read on in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and he saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And so he split the wood for the burnt offering. He arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Interesting word, we will come back to you. He thinks he's going to go sacrifice his son, but we're going to come back to you. Now, you don't find it here. You will find it in Hebrews, and we'll look at it a little bit later. But the writer of Hebrews says of Abraham, he knew that God would have to resurrect Isaac. He would have to, because he is the son of the promise. So even if he was going to be put back, or if he was going to be put to death, he would have to resurrect. 
So again, you see the gospel all over this. At everywhere that you look and everywhere that you turn, it's the only way to make this make any sense because God would never ask somebody to sacrifice their son in the literal sense, let alone make him a burnt offering. Where That means that everything is totally consumed. All right, That's what a burnt offering was. Nothing remains of it. So we see he said to his young men, stay here and then we'll come back. Well, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and, and the knife, and the two of them went together. Now this knife, we kind of think of a little pocket knife kind of a thing. Um, best for us to understand where else you see this word used for this kind of knife, it was used in another place, this kind of knife, and it was about hacking up humans. It's not meant for just little, you know, surgical cuts or, you know, you're just going to kind of kind of cut him or something like that. This was meant to inflict incredible bodily damage. <laughs> so I just, again, I, I, I know it's not comical, but I just got to wonder, when did Isaac get to the point of saying, something does not seem right here. Something seems amiss. And again, he's not a child, so if he's going to resist, it, he's, he's in on part of it, there, it must be. He knows that a sacrifice is going to be made because his father gives him the wood. And they're going up to a place, there's a sacrifice that's going to be made. He has to know why they've traveled to this place. He doesn't, he can't possibly know that it is he who's going to be sacrificed. But he's obedient to some point, and, and I, I suppose it must have all been really weird. We get that here in just a couple of verses. When he starts to see that he's being tied up, that he doesn't do any kind of a protest of this. It's a fascinating thing. And, and why is that? No one knows. It's not given us in the text here. Well, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac. So he's the one who's carrying this. Now, some people take the symbolism behind this, I think, a little farther than it really should go. Because, you know, you know, he puts the wood on Isaac's back. Jesus had a wooden cross. I mean, we can get to the point of almost absurdity. So as you look at this, and, and again, it's important when we look at symbolism, it's a good thing that we look at things in the symbolic way, of course. What we don't want to do is take the symbolism so far that it gets to absurdity or to conjecture and speculation. That's where things start to get a little bit dicey. Well, in, uh, in verse 7, So Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, this is said so matter-of-fact in the way that we read it, but I kind of get to the point where I look at this and think, he's got to be saying, wait a minute, there's something really missing here. We've got all of the things that are there, and I, I kind of you know, get the impression that he's asking this in a, almost a nervous kind of a way. So where is the sacrifice here? We've got all the implements. Everything is prepared, but... And here's this amazing thing that is said, verse 8. So Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. And so the two of them went up together. Now, the one thing that's very easy to read past when you look at that is there are two words there. For himself. That's the important part of this. God will provide for himself the offering, that which would be offered. So Abraham knows that it's Isaac who is to be what is going to be sacrificed. But then he says God will provide for himself this offering. Now, of course, it is impossible to know if Abraham is looking at this and saying, you, Isaac, were provided in an impossible way. You were provided by God, and there's no way you should be here. And now you're the one that's going to be sacrificed. Is that what he means? Or does he mean by the time that we get there, God's going to have to come up with some alternative? Hard to say. Because to this point yet, he had not bound Isaac, he had not put him on the altar, he had not drawn the knife, he had not done all of those things. But at every step, he has to be saying, I've, I've got to be dependent on the Lord, so what's next? So he continues bit by bit. Again, I put myself in the, in the, the place here and, and think, if I'm Abraham, how do, you, how do you do this? How do you go step by step and do you continue to go through the motions before asking God, when are you going to step in and when are you going to do something about this? You know, again, we, we can't know. Well, but he does say this important thing. Whether he realizes how prophetic it is or not is, is another question. But God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. So they came to the place of which God had told them. 
And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And so he bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar, uh, and then upon the wood. But there's no fight that's given here, which is an interesting thing. So Abraham stretched out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. But then the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, says it twice, so he said, here I am. Once again, it's a, it's a common refrain for him. God called him at first, Abraham, here I am. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your son, the one that you love, your only son. I want you to go and travel to Moriah. We're going to ask you to offer your son there. No protest, no nothing. It's just let's put things together. See, there had been times, like I said, when Abraham did take things into his own hands. He, he didn't operate necessarily by faith, and so they made mistakes along the way. In this time, he is tested in a way he would never have been tested before or would be afterwards. He's about to, to do the thing that is unthinkable. This is a good time for us to take a little run over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Let's go there. And we pick up a little bit on this in Hebrews 11. Now, this is what they call the Hall of Faith chapter, right? So it gives us a list of, of a number of people and the things that, that they're identified as doing. Now, if you've ever taken the time to study chapter 11, I love how it focuses only on the successes of people who walk by faith. <laughs> but if you know anything about some of these people's lives, because there are a lot of, there's a lot of details on guys like Moses and guys like Abraham, and you wouldn't say that they were perfect as far as their faith was concerned. They had plenty of folly, didn't they? And yet none of it is, is recorded in chapter 11. Only the successes, only the times that they walked by faith. And so why is that important? Well, because there are a lot of times that all of us really miss the mark, right? Aren't you glad that God doesn't like to record and remind us of all of our failure? Instead, he likes us to be reminded of the things that when he said something that we were obedient to it and walked by faith, and then he shows the fruit of it. Reminding us of that so that we are more trained on the, on the success rather than the failure. He doesn't remove it in the way of, you know, you can't ever remember those things. I won't bring it to your attention, those kind of things. There are those times we're reminded of our failures. And sometimes being reminded of your failure is a good way to avoid it the next time. But I am grateful that God rejoices in the success of walking with him by faith. That's the things, those are the things that it is, is wise to dwell upon. Well, chapter 12 does that, because you don't hear any mention of Ishmael, you don't hear any mention of all that kind of stuff, or him, you know, and, and with, whether it's Abimelech or the Pharaoh of lying and saying it's your sister, or then trying to cover it up by saying, well, she's, you know, technically I'm not incorrect, she's my half-sister. That, you know, that, that was his excuse last week, if you were here for that study. But look at what it says of him. We pick up Abraham and Sarah in verse 8. It says, by faith. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out from the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And so he went out not knowing where he was going. But by faith he dwelt in the land of promise. And he was as a foreigner in that country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of that same promise. So he just went. Not a place he knew of. He had never visited there. God just said, I'm going to take you to a place. Are you willing to go? Well, we see that he was willing to go. It says now, also, verse 10, For he waited for the city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What a cool thing it is to be said of him. Again, this is, this is the writer of Hebrews explaining a little bit about this man and his character. So the idea that he would, he would be a sojourner or move from place to place... He didn't put up some permanent resident. He didn't build a big place. He went from place to place. He lived in tents, as it said. He was looking for something that was much greater than that, realizing that the promises that God had made to him were eternal. Through, the, through you, the nations will be blessed. You'll have descendants that can't be numbered. They're like the sands of the sea or the stars in heaven. So we see in, in verse 11, So by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Not initially, but that's not mentioned here, is it? No, no, no. It's the focus of 
finally they had come to the point of recognizing when God makes a promise, he is worthy of our trust. And so we believe those things and we act accordingly and then he brings it to fruit. It's an acceptable thing to him at that point. So, verse 12, Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude innumerable as the sands of the seashore. That idea that he as good as dead just meant that he and Sarah both were well beyond the years where they should be able to bear children. So he may as well have been a dead man walking because there was no way that naturally they were going to have children. The verse 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So these were people who said, Look, I may not ever see what God has promised, but I know that eventually it will come to pass because he's promised it. Whether it's to me or to my descendants, eventually he's going to bring it about. So look at, look at this. These people that are mentioned to this thus far are about 4,000 years in history. And God is still not done with this work that he is doing among his creation. So they look. Now, here's the cool thing about it. They do see it realized. Because now they're in heaven, right? They've seen it all come to pass. Jesus has come. He's done away with sin. The only thing that he awaits, or that, that these people await, is when the rest of those who are, are bought by the blood of Jesus are united as one group and God brings all of the redeemed together in one place. Now that's about all that there is left, but these guys have now finally seen the fruit of all of that they had, that they had uh, waited for. Well, in verse 14 it says, For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to call them, uh, to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So that talks a little bit about those guys and how they didn't need to go back. They were taken out of the place and they were brought to the place God wanted them to be. There was no reason for them to go back. They are now partaking in what is the perfect of all those things. But notice how he comes back to Abraham. And Isaac, verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Now, the writer of Hebrews is writing this after all of the things that had taken place with Jesus, and he wants to make sure we understand the parallels here. Of whom it was said, in Isaac your, your seed will be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in the figurative sense. So the point is, Abraham had to have realized that even if he was to follow through with this, that God was going to have to raise Isaac from the dead because he was the son of the promise. This is why he was able to do exactly as God had commanded him, though it made no sense. And it would have tested anybody to say, how can God possibly ask me to do this? The idea of a human sacrifice would be an abomination to him let alone a burnt offering, because that would be for sin. And how is it that he would have me kill my son to deal with the matter of sin? That was being done in the idea of bulls and goats and all the rest of that, right? So you start to see that there's much more going on in this whole thing. So back to chapter 22 in Genesis. They've had their three days on the way to this location. Here they are, offering up. And now God stops them. Now they're going to go on to say the rest of this. So verse 12, this angel of the Lord, and this angel of the Lord is, is obviously unusual because he's not just one of many angels because he speaks as though he, he has a different authority than an angel would because what is being proven to this angel wouldn't be proven to just any angel. That would be somebody who is a messenger of God and, and rather that you've done this thing to show God. Rather this, this angel saying you've shown these things to me. So isn't it a, an interesting thing to consider? This would be a pre-incarnate Jesus who is seeing Abraham do something that would end up happening to him when he becomes flesh and blood and dwells among us. How crazy is that to, to consider? Look at what he says. So he said, 
Do not let your hand on the ladder do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. This is the angel speaking, is it not? Look at angel of the Lord said, called out to him. You have not withheld him from me. Was it not God who gave him the direction to do it in the first place? Yeah, kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Again, you have to read this a little more carefully than just sometimes you might read regular English and just go through a story. Well, so Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and he took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. So this is exactly what I, or, um, Abraham had said would take place, though he didn't have the assurance that this was going to be the, play, uh, the case, right? God will provide for himself the ram for the sacrifice, or the lamb, whatever you want to say. The important part of it is though he, you know, people would say he knew that God was going to bail him out. Really? He had drawn the knife ready to do in Isaac. So don't tell me that he knew that God was going to intervene that way. By this time he knows, all right, nothing else has been done. So this must mean he's going to bring my son back to life even if he is put to death. And as he's about to do it is when God stops him by this angel of the Lord. I believe clearly it's Jesus before we knew him as Jesus because he says, you didn't hold him back from me. No mere angel would be the one who's saying holding him back from me. This is no ordinary angel. Well, so he lifted up his eyes, he saw this, and so they offered it up. And then... In verse 14, it says, Then Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh. And as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Now, what this demonstrates for us is so much of what we would understand as far as the gospel is concerned. And I guess we'll do that as a, as a you know, we'll wrap it up here at the end of it. But notice in verse 15, it says this. So the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. So he's addressing him, and it says, a second time. There's more to this. And he said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. Now remember, this is, this is the reiteration of what was already promised to him. Now, was God surprised that he was obedient? Hardly, because he already knew the outcome of this. Look, here's one thing that God cannot do. He can't learn anything, because he already knows it. So again, this is for the benefit of Abraham and of Isaac and everyone who would hear their eyewitness testimony. It would be to the generations, it is to us thousands of years later to read this and to say that God was telling a story that would only have its completion when it was Jesus. So all the types here are present. A father offering a son who was beloved and the only begotten. Remember that's already been said. Your only begotten son is who you're going to offer. Now begotten in God's eyes, the son Ishmael was a work of the flesh not a work of the Spirit. It wasn't done in faith. It was taking matters into his own hands. So, of course, that would not be the only begotten. There was only one begotten, and that was Isaac because he was that son of promise. He was supernatural. So, when we look at the idea of burnt offerings being offered for sin and all the rest of that, remember that it was done in order to be a, a, an aroma or a, a sweet-smelling aroma. That's what was meant by the olah, and so that, that smell would come up and it would be as an acceptable offering to God. Now here's an amazing thing. When you stop to see that, looking at all the types, when it was Jesus, he was, he was consumed not by fire, but he gave everything and then ascended up. It was acceptable as far as God was concerned because now the matter of sin was going to be done away with once and for all. And when they would do it as an atonement in the Old Testament sense, by the time it was formalized through the Levitical priesthood and it was being done at the tabernacle and then the permanent locations of the temple, it was being done and it got to the point where it was just so common and run of the mill that you know, the, the priests even became corrupted. But it was always supposed to be this. Again, because of Leviticus chapter 17 where it says that I have given blood as an atonement, life is in the blood, and without the blood there is no remission of sin. 
whenever they would be offering up an animal the way that they did, it would be to take care of the sin of mankind, but it was always going to be a foreshadowing of the finished work of Jesus because it's not being done any longer. So when you talk to people and you say, look, the Old Testament used to have sacrifices and they were happening continually because man was continually sinning. And what a, what a futile thing that that would be because it had to be repeated over and over and over again. And here, every time that they would offer up to God, hopefully out of right hearts, God would say, the day's coming. You won't have to do this any longer. The book of Hebrews talks about that. A one-time sacrifice never to be repeated because finally sin had been done away with in his son. And so here, 2,000 years before that event, we see a father offering up his only begotten that it would take care of this, whatever it was that was being seen as a need for a sacrifice. All the while, it is only giving us in all of the symbolic ways that there was something perfect that was coming. So we see... He says to him, remember he reiterates all of the different promises that were given. Blessing I will bless you. Multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sands which are on the seashore. And your descendants will possess the gate of their enemies. So now he is starting to say not only that, and of course we know the ebb and flow of their history. There were times that they did and times that they didn't. And remember that the nation itself wasn't great because of number, right? Remember, he says that to Moses, or through Moses in Deuteronomy. He says, look, I didn't choose you guys because you're the greatest of the numbers. I've chosen you because I love you. And so we know that during the times, especially of David, probably more than at any other time and into Solomon's reign, no one could withstand Israel, though they had the numbers. The surrounding nations were subject to Israel because they had the favor of God and God fought their battles. Now, he says this, and again, it's an interesting thing that he doesn't say, but man, your kids are going to make some mistakes, and then their kids from there, and you're going to go into servitude and all the rest. Though he has told them that. He's told that to Abraham, right? They're going to have to go into a place of slavery, and they're going to have to be there for hundreds of years, and they're going to be slaves in a foreign land that they don't know, but I'll bring them back. Remember, he's already told him that. He's already said this to Abraham. But since Abraham was obedient this time, he says, because of your obedience, I reestablish, or I, I have already established, I'm reaffirming it because you've done this in your obedience. You're going to have these generations, and you will possess the gates of your enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Again, let's make sure we point out what should be plainly obvious to us. If there's going to be somehow a blessing that would be to the generations, to the nations, okay? It says right there, in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So that includes the Gentiles, that includes all of them. Was there ever a blessing from any of his kids, direct descendants that we saw in the generations all the way up to the 12 tribes that had anything to do with the Gentiles? Not a one. When did that actually start to, to see fruit that even the generations or the nations or the Gentiles would somehow be part of this blessing. That was because of Jesus. Absolutely. And we saw it go out in full force by the time that Paul started to go into all the parts of the world. So it took a while for that to come to fruit, but that was the reality. So this promise that was made to Abraham, how could that ever have come to a, a conclusion and to fulfillment until the person of Jesus where the nations, plural, could be blessed because now sin had been atoned for. So you see the picture that's being illustrated here. It's the gospel in, in Genesis 22. It's pretty clear from everything that you read here. So it says, So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and they went together to Beersheba, and uh, Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. One of the places that we go to when we're in Israel, Beersheba, I guess it's not normal that a lot of people don't see Beersheba when they go there. But Beersheba is ancient as you see right here. It goes back to those times. So the beginning of the nation of Israel is found in the person to whom it was promised, Abraham. And Beersheba is an area where he did an awful lot of things, all the way up through Jacob. Remember the guy last week we looked at, Abimelech? Remember how he, was, he and Abraham had their little back and forth? By chapter 26, Abimelech's having something going on with Jacob. And so there's a dispute over that area. So it's very much in the south, but as you see here, it's about a three days journey. If you're making good pace, you can get to Jerusalem. 
we end up, uh, the, when we're there in Israel, we start the morning at the Dead Sea and we come up from the south and Beersheba is the first place that we hit. And it's also the place that, that, uh, uh, that Elijah, when he was threatened by Jezebel, runs all the way there. Now, Carmel, where that took place, is way up in the north. And he goes this far and then goes even further out into the wilderness, all because of a threat. After he just saw God do what he did to the prophets of Baal. So, again, these things that are <laughs> matters of faith. And it's such an interesting thing how so much of these places get tied together. How many things happen at these places. So it says that he goes back to Beersheba. Now, we see in verses 20 to 24... We see that word comes back to him that descendants are now born. And this is put there probably in a, in a parenthetical way because we're going to revisit this in chapter 24. Because you notice there at verse 23 it says, Then Bethuel beget Rebekah. Rebekah would be the one that was going to be the wife. That is, they look for a wife for Isaac. So it, this is, again, it's parenthetic. We'll end up picking it up in chapter 24 when we take a look at them. Now, to put a little fine point on this, we've looked at the passage there in Hebrews. We've looked at what we saw in, in Jesus talking about that uh, the scriptures testify of me. There's also something that I think is very important to us. Now, let's go ahead and, and pull away, if you will, briefly from Genesis here as we look through this historical aspect. And now, if you look at it in the evangelical sense, let's say that you're getting a chance to minister to somebody or you're, you're, you're trying to testify of them by saying, what you see in the New Testament, if you have a good operational understanding of the Old Testament, those things wouldn't be surprising to you. And again, it's one of my, my real frustrations when I hear people say that when it comes to the Old Testament, that yeah, we can reference it and everything else, but it shouldn't be necessarily a focus. I've heard of some people go as far as to say that uh, we're a New Testament church and we're in the time of the New Testament, we're under grace, we're no longer under law, so we don't even spend time in the Old Testament. That's folly. That's just silliness. And it, it, it's going to make sure that you have a, a church that is really illiterate biblically. That's, what, that's going to be the end result of it. Because again, if you were to try, try to say, well, we want to focus on the gospel. Man, have you ever read Genesis 22? You want the gospel? Before the gospel was even known, chapter 22 is your place. Talk about a great place to be able to use as a witness. And say, do you know that the idea of a father offering his son for some kind of a sacrifice is not unusual? It's very unusual in the sense that it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense where you see it in chapter 22, and unless you knew who Jesus is and what was done with him, chapter 22 would make no sense whatsoever because God would never ask somebody to offer their son. However, he would because that was the cost of sin. Something that was innocent was going to have to pay for the guilt of the guilty, and it had to be a perfect sacrifice, and there is no such thing on earth that would ever do that. So God had to become one of us great way to start with the witness. Now here's the thing that I also think that it's important for us to recognize too. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. As I look up at the clock, this will give us the, we'll be ending a little bit early uh, this evening because uh, the next chapter is kind of going to have to stand on its own and I, it'll take a little while to get through it. But chapter 9 of Isaiah says a very important thing. It deals with, with you know, the idea of father and son and all the rest of it. So chapter 22 of Genesis has all the important elements, if you will, that here is the man who is seen as the father of the faith, Abraham, and he's finally, after all the time of waiting, given a son, and the son is one of promise, and that because of God making good on giving them that son, now the nations of mankind will see eventually the blessing of that son. So you can go through and look at all of the elements. So here is a father who takes his son. There's three days journey. And I think that there's a significance to that when it comes to the idea of Jonah and three days as being dead. Jesus using that as a sign. This idea of three days has a significance to it, especially when we're looking at it 
in the sense of Jesus and being a son that was offered in three days is dead and all the rest. So you see this really obvious symbolism. Again, the scholars will dispute whether or not Moriah is the place that we think of today that where Abraham would have offered Isaac. To me, from God's perspective, since he's telling a symbolic story, I don't know where it would be other than that place. Because if Moriah is the place where we know Jesus was offered, it only makes sense that God would have had Abraham bring his son to that same place because he's telling us the same story. Though it never came to fruition that Abraham offered his son, it was always speaking in type and that, that idea of a lamb being offered that God provided for himself, that is deliberate because at a time appointed to only known to God at the time, he was going to offer a lamb for the sacrifice. And it would be a permanent thing. So Abraham is acting out and even saying things that he has no idea the profound truth that is found behind them. So if you're able to walk people through this whole thing in a way of, of trying to witness to them, it'd be great to bring it all full circle and take it to chapter 9 of Isaiah. Because ultimately we understand this. And again, you know, we're halfway through the year about now, and that means we're halfway to Christmas. So by Christmas, we're going to start giving out Christmas cards, and it'll have this verse. Somebody's going to give away this, these uh, um, Christmas cards, and it'll have this passage here, which it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And it talks about him being wonderful, being a counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we know about him. The important part of this is to recognize, yet again, this idea of father and son, this relationship that is there. But notice what it said and how it said to us. Now again, this is 700 years plus before the birth of Jesus when this is being prophesied. Now it tells us this, for unto us a child is born. Great, we've got that. So we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem just like Micah told us that it would, or that he would be. We know that that's the case, that was what was to be expected. And so a child, yes, was born. But here's the important part of that. Unto us, a son is given. So if there's a son, then there's a father of that son. Now, who are the participants here? The father is God, the son is Jesus, and he's been given as a gift to us. Not just that he had a life and that we were able to be taught by him and everything else. No, no, no. That's important, yeah. But when you look at, at what Jesus did in his teaching and all the rest, it was all leading to one thing. And that is that he would be put to death on Moriah for the sin of mankind. And without him, there is no way to be reconciled to God. He is that innocent that paid for the guilt of the guilty. And without him, there is no life. Let's just say it like it is. So Isaiah holds us accountable for this by telling us that there is a son that was born, a child rather that was born, but he is a son and he belongs to someone. This is the important part of evangelism, is to recognize that God loved his son, and he didn't just send him here on a, on a you know, like, he, he showed up out of nowhere, and one day he was there, he put to death, and then left the next day that he, he made that sacrifice. He dwelt among his creation. He taught them, he instructed them, he gave them three years of his life. And then these men have carried that on. It's why we have the Bible here in front of us. is because God wanted a record of these things. And he wanted not only a record, but it was that record that was going to make man accountable. That's hugely important. No one will be able to say, well, if only God had told us something. Well, he's told us everything that you could ever need to know. If you don't take the time to look at it, that's not his fault. He went to great lengths to make sure it's understandable. So when you see this, every time that you read this, this verse right here, just verse 6, remember this. A child was born, which meant that he had to come into this creation. I believe it's the same angel that was having the dialogue with Abraham. That that very same angel, he would be able to look at that and say, this is the very same place where I will do this when I take upon myself flesh and blood. Because he speaks with the authority of God to Abraham, doesn't he? So when we look at these things in the Christmas cards and all the rest, just remember this. A son was given to us, a child that was born, and that means that there's an accountability. We will stand before the Father someday when he says, 
I gave you my son as a gift. That child that was born. So what did you do with the gift? That's the, that's the big story that's here. So we see, again, the gospel back in chapter 22. What we'll pick up, um, now next week is communion. We're going to end about, about 10 minutes early tonight. Um, but you'll see that uh, in verse 20, or chapter 23 at verse 1, it says, Now Sarah lived 127 years, and these were the years of her. So she passes at this point. And then there is this idea that there's going to be a burial plot. This happens in Hebron. So from Beersheba, Hebron would be a little bit to the north and a little bit to the east of that. But it's still in that same general area. And so the, uh, the tombs of, of the patriarchs are in that place. Now, it's a place that's not necessarily very easy to go and see. I'd love to be able to go to Hebron and, and go see those places, but it's a contested area and uh, not necessarily wonderful to travel in. So interestingly enough, uh, we will pick that up in chapter uh, 23, week after next. Next week is uh, communion. But I hope that you, you carefully consider all the elements that you see in chapter 22 and realize it's no mistake. It was done with incredible deliberate intent to tell the story of the gospel 2,000 years before it would actually be played out so that it would never take anybody by surprise, right? Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll have the group come back up and we'll close with a song. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your word. And we're so grateful that you have given us your word that we may know these things. There was such intent behind these, these, uh, these events, this one story, and uh, th that so much was being told to us. So we ask, Lord, that you would help us again to be not only attentive to what we've learned tonight, but that you would help us to use it as a, as a reason for evangelism and that we would uh, recognize the importance of this story, that we would use it as opportunity that it would also just galvanize in us and, and uh, in our own hearts, God, that we would dedicate to you. So we thank you. We give you all the praise and honor. We pray that you would be glorified in us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart. Grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing.
my chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns on it. Amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God. God bless you and have a great week.